Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. We have a very special guest in studio. He's a friend of the show. You've seen him on the show before. It's Dr. Richard Wolf, and uh, he is a Marxian economic, uh, economist, best known for his work on Marxian economics, economic methodology, and class analysis. He's a professor emeritus at UMass Amher Amherst, and he's a host of a weekly radio show on Pacifica Economic Update, which is also on YouTube. Please welcome back to the show, Richard Wolf. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Now, please, for a, for a dumb guy like me, please explain what that means, Marxian economics. Okay, good. Um, I'm glad you asked. You know, after World War II, America changed. And you really have to go back to make sense of this. During World War II, and I'm always amazed at how many Americans don't know this, we were allied with the Soviet Union. If you went into a post office in the United States to pick up a few stamps in the 1940s, you would see a picture of Uncle Sam hand in hand with Uncle Joe. And Uncle Joe was Joseph Stalin because he was the great ally in the fight against Germany and Japan, the fascists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Americans had gotten used to our buddies, the communists in Russia. Then at the end of the war, everything changed, and everybody had to learn to hate and fear what before had been the big allies. That was a trauma. That's hard on a, any population. And Americans got real scared that somehow the war that they had just fought to make us safe hadn't done it. We were now in danger, nuclear weapons and all of that. So what happened in the United States was that anything that had anything to do with Russia or Soviet Union or communism was considered so bad, so toxic, so scary that you wouldn't go near it. And since the Russians had kept referring to themselves as followers of Karl Marx, this stuff applied to Marxism. And you weren't supposed to get the book out of the library and you weren't supposed to read it. Let me give you an example. I have a PhD in economics. Nobody ever asked me as part of my curriculum to get that PhD to read one word of Karl Marx, who was, after all, whatever else you think of him, the biggest and greatest critic of capitalism ever. So we have a generation, my generation, that doesn't know the most important criticism of our economic system that exists. So all it means when you call me a Marxist is, I went against the grain. I said, I'm going to read this stuff. If there's nothing in there, okay. I will have learned not to pay much more attention. I went, I read it, and guess what? I discovered there's lots of interesting ideas there. The way I like to explain it to people is simple. If you wanted to understand a family lived up the street, and you knew they had a father, mother, two kids. And you knew one kid loved the family, thought they were lucky to be born into that family, and the other one thought it was a psychological basket case. If you were going to write a story analyzing that family, would you talk to one kid, either one, and not the other one? Makes no sense. You talk to them both, you hear what they have to say, then you draw your own conclusions. We live in a country that was so scared of our enemy, who had been our friend before, that we refuse to look at it. It's a little bit like a child scared of a, of a dog puts his or her hands in front of their eyes and imagines a dog goes away. The dog doesn't go away. Marxian theory, Marxian economics, is a criticism of capitalism. It makes a whole lot of arguments about why capitalism ain't so good and we could do better. Given the situation of the world today, seems to me a reasonable thing to at least read this stuff. And that's all I ever did as I read it. And so what is Marx, what are some of his prescriptions to fix capitalism that we could into implement? Well, his point of view is a little different. His point of view is we've tried to fix it. We've tried over and over to fix it. We've had all good efforts to fix it. You can't fix it. It's busted. It's a little bit, for Marx in economics, it's a little bit like having that meeting with the refrigerator repairman comes to your house. He's been to your house now more and more frequently. This time it's the condenser, next time it's the motor, next time it's the this. And then there comes that sad moment when he comes to you and he says, look, I could take another couple of hundred bucks and fix it, but you're throwing money away. It's time to get a new refrigerator. And you don't want to hear it, 
but you kind of know, since he's a straight guy, that he's giving it to you honestly, and you, you might as well save the $200. Marx's argument is you need a different system. You can't, we've tried, for example, to have less inequality in our world. We have more than we've ever had. We have inequality now that takes you back to ancient Egypt. Right. You know, Jeff Bezos has $129 billion. I mean, it's obscene, basically. Right. You have millions of people can't pay their kids college, can't do the mm -hmm. most basic things a society wants to do. And so Marx would say, hey, uh, this system produces inequality. It always has. And it keeps doing that until people arise up and say, we've had it. And then it stops for a while, and then it starts up again. So you kind of ought to learn the lesson. Uh, the system's busted. Let's try something else. And what do you say we should try? Marx's argument's very elementary in this area because he didn't spend a lot of time. He didn't believe in looking into the future and guessing how things would. He didn't believe in that. He made a joke once. If you want that, go to the county fair, give money to the, the lady who tells you your future. It's fun. It's amusing. But you don't take that seriously. She doesn't really know what's going to happen to you next month. So he didn't do much. So you have to kind of read between the lines and tease it out. And this is what it would look like. His argument is we have an economic system, this capitalist system, that puts a very small number of us in the driver's seat. If you look at the percentage of people who own shares of stock in America, you get a very quick understanding. One percent of shareholders own two-thirds of all the stock. So if you're looking at who owns American business, it's a tiny, it's the one percent that everybody's talking about. And they're the ones who elect every year, that's how it works, the board of directors of every corporation. The, you get on the board of directors by being elected by the shareholders. If 1% of the people own two-thirds of the shares, that's who elects the boards of directors. Not grandma who has 10 shares of something, or not Uncle Harry who got three shares on his last birthday, but the people, the big bankers and the big wealthy folks who have it. So the argument is... We have an economic system where all the basic decisions are made by the shareholders who own the company and the boards of directors they elect. They're the ones who decide what the company produces, what technology it uses, where the production takes place, and what to do with the profits. At the Christmas party, they thank everybody in the company for helping to make the profits. But everybody may have helped to produce them, but everybody doesn't get any say at all in what's done with them. That's in the hands of the board of directors and the shareholders. So here then Marx makes a, a grin and says, do we really expect anything different? If you let the people in charge be a tiny minority, they're going to make the system work for them. They're not going to make the system work for the people who've been excluded. So his answer is don't exclude them. And if you want the simple English, worker co-ops. Make business organize in a radically different way. All the people in a business live with the decisions that are made there. And if they all have to live with the decisions, they should all participate. It's the same logic as, as it runs our communities. We say a mayor can't make those important decisions that a mayor or a city council or a president, for that matter, makes without our having some say in voting. Well, then... The same logic, if you apply it to the workplace, would be how can you let two or three or four or six or 12 members of the board of directors make a decision, close a plant, move it to China, or any one of the other decisions they make, impacting everybody else, and everybody else has no say at all. That's not democracy. And if, you know, I push it as follows. If we believe in democracy as a nation, which we claim so often we do, then the first place we should have put it is where we work. Five out of seven days, the adult human being in America, most of us go to work. If democracy is valuable, put it, to put it into play where we work. It's at least as important as where we live. Where we live, we supposedly have it. We don't have it where we work. And my guess is our economy would work a lot different if the people were in charge, rather than having it be in, in the hands of a very small number of people who, if I'm noticing correctly, I'm a professor of economics, I'm supposed to know this, the system is working really well for them. Yes. Do, right? It's going great for the people who uh, own stock. All right. For the owner class, it's going very good. So I have two things to say. So it seems like capitalism's working in Denmark, Right. Well, they hedge it about with, with levels of controls and limits 
that Americans would find very strange. I would argue with you it's working better than it works here. But I think it has serious problems there, too. You have a gap between rich and poor. It's not like it is here in the United States, but you have it. You don't see it because they have a, ba a basic social welfare program. All your medical care is taken care of. There's a national health service. Basically, the university uh, going to school is free or close to free, heavily subsidized, uh, and on and on and on. Right. So they, they make sure that the really rough edges of capitalism are softened. But my argument would still be you have the inequalities, not like you have in the United States, but you have serious inequalities, and I don't see the justification for them. And if I knew more about Danish society, my guess is I'd be able to show you that that has consequences, making inequality like that. But you're right. It is certainly not the kind of capitalism we have in the United States. And by, and by the way, that's true across Europe. The Europeans don't permit it. The right. mass of people in Europe don't permit their governments and their businesses uh, to function the way we do. One example. In Germany, there's a law. The German word is Mitbestimmung. Uh, it means participating in the decision. Here's what the law in Germany says. The law was passed in 1976, so this is not new. If you're an enterprise in Germany with more than 2,000 workers... One half the members of the board of directors in that company have to be elected by the workers. It's the law. That's unthinkable in that the United States. That is unthinkable States. in the Unthink United States. That's a law. If you have less than 2,000 workers, I think it's uh, 50 to 2,000, one third of the members of the board of directors have to be elected by the workers. And Germany is an example of a country that's been doing real well in recent Economically, years. Economically, sure. So, Putting the workers on the board there didn't end the system, didn't erupt the system, didn't collapse, the system, none of it. They did better than we did for most of the last decade since the crash. So I would argue that many in Europe have figured out ways to limit the damage that capitalism has done. And of course, that for us as here in America, that's an attractive alternative to letting the thing run the way we let it run. So a lot of people would say... Uh what we're taught or what we're brainwashed with in the United States is that uh, the kind of economic system we're talking about, say, in Denmark, that uh, they, they would look at that as socialism, even though it's not socialism. Uh, and they say that that economic system makes everyone equally poor. What do you say when people say that? Well, it the easiest answer is take a trip someday to Copenhagen and it'll take you exactly five minutes to understand that's nonsense. Uh, the standard of living of most workers in Europe, uh, particularly in Northern Europe uh, that we're talking about, is as high or higher than that of the United States in terms of the quantity and quality of the goods and services that they get. So, I mean, it just isn't the case. You don't have to have everybody poor in order to be fair. It's the oldest argument in the book of people who don't want to distribute things equally that if we did that, either the world would fall apart or we'd all be very poor. I mean, that's a kind of thin effort to shut that conversation down. Okay. And, so and let, me, let me, in a halfway way, Jeff Bezos has $129 billion dollars. If we took away half of his wealth, he'd be left with $65 billion. Guess what? That would make him one of the 10 richest people on the pl planet if we took half of it away. And imagine what we could do with that $65 billion. We could solve the problem of all the college educations in the United States more than once over. We could transform the continent of Africa in radical ways that would make them our friends for the next 150 years, what we there's no excuse for a society that produces that kind of inequality and then lets it sit, sit there. there. I know it's staggering. Well, what I've said about Jeff Bezos is that the, it's been estimated that to end homelessness in the United States, it would cost 20 billion dollars. To end world hunger, it would cost 30 billion dollars. So he could end world hunger and homelessness <laughs> in the United States and still Dude, have around 70 billion dollars right, left over. Right, making him one of the ten. You know, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, yes. and him. And yet and he doesn't just, do it. No. 
yet he doesn't do it. And That's I right. always pr- say, what kind of a person amasses more wealth than any human in history, while the people who generate that income for him are poor and on food stamps? A mm. megalomaniac. Right. That's who does that. Oh, and it's even worse. I, you know, Amazon, which is the company that made him rich. Yes. An enormous percentage, the estimates vary, but somewhere between 10 and 20% of Amazon's workers are paid so little they qualify for food yeah, stamps, that's which means the rest of us, you, me, the people listening and watching, those people, we all pay taxes right. to subsidize the low wages that this billionaire, I mean, you have to scratch your head in disbelief that the American people allow that level of behavior, it's antisocial behavior. Now they right, they probably have you on uh, CNN and MSNBC every week talking about every this, right? Every week, man, they can't get enough of me. <laughs> Please make sure you're subscribed. It only takes a second. Make sure you're subscribed and click that bell so they give you a notice whenever we drop a video. And if you can become a patron, we give you hours of bonus material every week. Our next live show is June 30th in Portland, Oregon. And we do a super solid chat every Saturday. That's our live stream. You can ask us questions and we answer back. That's Saturdays at 2 p.m. Pacific. Plus, we're on Steam It. We're steaming it right now. 